Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. How many remember exactly where you were 15 years ago today? It's one of those days that will forever be etched in our memory. We watched the videos being replayed over and over again of the World Trade Towers being struck. I, I ran some numbers. They are 2,700, 2,752 were killed in the World Trade Centers, 2,752. 184 were killed in the Pentagon that same day, 40 more in Pennsylvania. And there were 11 unborn babies that were also killed during the attack on the World Trade Centers, making a total of 2,987 were killed on that day. It's one of those days that will forever live in infamy. And, uh, and the generations all the way down the line are affected all across this nation. I met someone coming in this morning, said that their son was there, but God spared his life. He got out. He was not killed in what took place and what happened there, and yet many, many more died out there. So a very vivid reminder of what happened. And at 15 years ago to this very day, it all took place. I want you to take your Bibles out. We're going we're gonna to look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at somebody whose life was crushed. He was left broken and beaten by this world. His world came caving in on top of him on this particular day in his life. We're going to look at his story, and we're going to bring it to where we live today and, and see what's going on and how, what God wants to say to every single one of us here this morning. So let's stand together to read God's word, and then we're going to pray. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 30. In, in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. And the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on the oil and the wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took two, out two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let us pray. Father, as we come to you today, we first of all thank you for your sweet, sweet presence here today. And once again rejoice at those who were celebrating their new birth in water baptism. 
Father, also today we're reminded of what happened 15 years ago. And I pray even today for families that have still been affected by that, that it will affect generations to come because they lost loved ones and family members. We remember firemen, Lord, who acted as good Samaritans who ran into that building at the risk of their own life, and some 300 died on that day. And God, we, we thank you for them. And we thank you, Lord, for America. And we thank you, God, that your hand has been on this country. And we pray that you will protect and heal our land, Lord Jesus. And Father, today as we look in your word, open up our hearts and minds to see the lesson that you want to teach us, that we, according to your word, would also go and, and do likewise in showing love. Help us this morning as I bring your word. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Mighty Lord, I cannot do this on my own. So I desperately need you today. And we love you and we thank you that you're here. We give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The story of the Good Samaritan is probably one of the most remarkable stories in the teachings of Jesus Christ. It is absolutely incredible story, and the way it's told, the way Luke describes it, the way he, he draws it all out is just an incredible, remarkable story, and it, it would make an, an exciting drama. You could build this out into a whole book, into a whole novel. It could be a movie, a made-for-movie event. It's just that powerful, and you have some key players in the events that took place. First of all, you have the victim. The victim is traveling alone through a mountain pass. I have been on that road that goes from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and, and there the elevations are distinctly different, and you're going over that track, and there's all kinds of places for robbers to hang out, to hide out, to jump you, to kill you. It was a road that was known to be inhabited by robbers who would steal from those who were traveling back and forth across that road, and they grabbed him and they beat him and they robbed him and they left him on the side of the road bruised and broken and dying. And then you have the priest and the Levites. These are the two men committed to helping the unfortunate. They take that, that vow that they're going to help all the unfortunate people, but they didn't have time in the day for a man gurgling in his own blood by the side of the road, and so they pass by. And then you have the Samaritan, the Samaritan who probably had every reason to hope the victim died because they didn't always get along, but inexplicably went to his assistance. And then you have the innkeeper, innkeeper who didn't particularly want to get involved, but he's pretty much forced to. And so he takes him into his inn and sees to his recovery. What a wonderful, incredible story that Jesus gives us. And he sets it up and he draws us in and we're the listeners and we're sucked into this very, very powerful story the way he tells it. But I want to tell you, if this story comes from the lips of Jesus and from his heart, if he is the one, our Savior, who tells a story, we better pay attention. Because there's a message in there for every single one of us today. He is drawing us into it, and we need to find ourselves and be a part of the story. And never has the church had a greater opportunity than to minister to those who are beat up by the world, broken, cast down, cast to the side, left to die, We've got that privilege and opportunity to bend down and help them along the way. And yet any number of Christians are reprising the role of the priest and the Levite. We're too busy. We got our agendas. Don't want to get my hands dirty. Got too much going on. Got to get to my family. Got to get to my kids. Got to get to my house. Got to get to my job. And we pass by on the other side of the road. Now, I want to give you the backdrop to this story. It's told in response to a question, the Bible says, by an expert in the law. And so he's trying to pin Jesus Christ down. And so go back to your Bibles. Let's look at Luke 10. Look at verse 25 to 29. And on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? 
He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he quotes from the Decalogue. He quotes from the law. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells that powerful story I read to you from the outset. Now, the expert of the law, he, he, he's connecting, he's doing something here. He says, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? Jesus Christ goes back, and he goes back to the law, and he goes back to the eternal God, the law that he gave us, and the first and highest law above everything else is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you're going to know eternity, you've got to know the creator of eternity, the one who has been from the very beginning. You've got to know him for yourself. You've got to have a relationship with him. It comes out of knowing God. That's how we have everlasting life. In fact, if I want to succinctly put it, we were made by God to love God. You were created with a purpose, and your purpose was to love God. And so it comes out, he's connecting eternal life with loving God. And if you don't love God, you'll never have eternal life. You won't have that free gift that God wants to give you. And, of course, the Bible tells us very clearly how you can find everlasting life if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life, have eternal life. And so God made the way by sending his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And if you'll put your faith in him, you can have eternal life. Put your faith in him and you can be baptized in water like those who are baptized saying, I'm a new creature, the old man's gone and I'm alive in Christ Jesus and it's powerful. It's all about loving God. And yet here's, here's the rub. We were created in the image of God and if God loves people, then we who were made in his image and everybody else who was created in his image, we've got to love them. We're made in his image to love, and so we've got to love people. Loving imperfect people is always more difficult than loving a perfect God. You see, God's perfect. Who can't help but love God? I mean, when you really think about it, God made us and gave us every good gift and sent his only begotten son. He's perfect. Who couldn't help but love a perfect God? But it's all his imperfect creation we are challenged by, right? Right? It's the imperfect people that rub us the wrong way. I found this poem. I've used it before, but just listen to it. It says it so well. Living above with God we love, oh, that will be glory. Living below with people we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> and so it is. In fact, it's even possible for us in the church, and here's what we're often guilty of, and we, we emphasize missions very heavily at Faith Assembly of God. And we say, yes, I love all those in Africa, and I love everybody in China, and I love everybody in India. But boy, I can't love this guy because he really gets my craw. He really just drives me nuts. He really pushes my buttons, whatever else you want to say. He just drives, he's like sandpaper. He always rubs me the wrong way. And so we're, we're better about loving people we're really not that close to. The trouble is, it's only those who are close to you that can hurt you. People in Africa, they're not going to hurt me. In India, China, they're not going to hurt me. I just pray for them and love them in Jesus and hope they all get saved. It's the ones who are close to us that can hurt us and offend us, do the wrong things. I, my mom, when, when, when I was growing up, she had an expression she used to use, and I don't know if you've ever heard it before, but she'd say to the, the boys, you are getting on my nerves. You're getting on my nerves, which meant we were about five seconds away from a whipping. And so uh, you're getting on my nerves. Anybody ever use that expression or say that? You're getting on. And there are people that just get on our nerves. They drive us crazy, and they make it very, very difficult and challenging for us to love them. And so you have this scribe here, and what he's trying to do is, the Bible says the scribe trying to justify himself. What does he mean by that? The scribe is trying to find out who he can exclude and who he can include. 
because he already has his prejudicial mind made up about who's not included in his group. So the scribe, in an attempt to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? He's looking for the loophole. He's looking for the way out. He's looking for the group he can exclude and not include in his group of guys he is supposed to love or has to love. And so he's trying to shut some people out. For us, maybe it's people of different religions. Maybe it's people of a different color. Maybe it's people of different lifestyle choices. Maybe it's people who are different or difficult than we are. And so in our mind, we know theoretically, I love God and I'm supposed to love everybody else, but I'm looking for that loophole. I'm looking for that group that I can exclude because at my core, there's a lot of prejudice I have to deal with. So we're trying to figure out who we include and who we exclude. And so it's that backdrop that Jesus tells us the story. So he tells a story about how we need to love others. Now, who is the man that was robbed on the side of the road? It's interesting. The Bible tells us nothing about him. That's intentional. There is nothing told to us about the man who is beat up. Now, we may assume he's Jewish, but the Bible doesn't even say that. You may assume he's Jewish by its proximity to Jerusalem. He's between Jerusalem and, and, and uh, Jericho, and so he's in, the middle, he's in the Holy Land, and so most likely he's Jewish. He's close to town there. Uh, he's probably, he could be Jewish because he's trying to draw a contrast between the Samaritan and the Jews, and so we'll get to that and how that whole racial divide took place. And so, but the Bible doesn't even tell us he was Jewish, so we don't know if he was or not. The Bible doesn't tell if he's rich, Bible doesn't tell us he was educated, if he was uh, poor, uh, it, it doesn't tell us anything about his nationality, nothing is in there, we simply don't know. So what is the point he's trying to make? The point is, the man in need could be anyone beat up by this world. He's not trying to tell us who we can help and who we can't help. He intentionally doesn't tell us who the man is because the bottom line is, our neighbor is anybody in need. Anybody who needs help, it doesn't matter where they come from, what they look like, what their background, anybody in need becomes my neighbor. The priest is not an ordinary person. The priest in the in New Testament times, he was the holiest and most powerful men of Israel. They were very dominant, they were very powerful, also very wealthy. The priests were the upper echelon in the economic strata of Israel at that time. And he's probably riding on a donkey because the wealthy for long distances didn't walk. They rode. And so he's riding his real nice Cadillac donkey and, uh, and he's upper class and, uh, and he doesn't take this journey on foot. And, and here's, the, here's the problem is he sees the man, he hears the man, he knows what's going on, he's drawn to him with his eyes, but he couldn't risk touching the bloody man. Because for him to touch the bloody man would have made him unclean, which would have meant when he got to Jerusalem, he would have had to go through all these ceremonial cleansing laws all over again that are found in the Old Testament before he could ever go back in the temple and serve again. And so because of that, so he values his position more than the life of a stranger. He values position more than the life of a stranger. Now let me tell you something, as Christians, listen to me, we have got to conquer our preoccupation with judging. We become great judges and we judge everybody else around us and we set ourselves up as judges over other people. The Lord says this, judge not that ye be not judged. Yet how often do we disobey because of our prejudice and our self-righteousness? Somehow we have set ourselves up when we judge others as better than them, able to look down on them, able to ascertain the situation and criticize them because at the core of judging or a judgmental attitude is an inherent self-righteousness and pride that I am better than them. And so we make ourselves judge and jury. We've got to reach out with love and compassion. The good Samaritan, when he comes later, doesn't snarl at the guy and says, you idiot, don't you know this is a dangerous road? You made your bed, lie in it. 
This is the consequences of your own actions. You made these choices in life, and so we wind up judging others. It was not his to condemn. It was only his responsibility to help. Second guy that comes by is the Levite. Levites are temple assistants. They worked in the temple. They weren't quite at the level of the priest. They were from the tribe of Levi. They served in the temple, worked around the temple. And maybe he doesn't want to risk becoming unclean as well. And so he refuses to stop. And so like the priest, he's on his road. But maybe he's just too busy. Doesn't have, he's, got, he's got an agenda. He's got things to do. He's got places to go. He's got people to see. He's got work to do. And, and maybe it's just going to be too costly. <coughs> and he thinks, I don't have the time and I don't have the resources. So it becomes too costly. Let me tell you something. Loving others is risky and costly and it will mess with your schedules. It'll mess your schedule up. It'll mess your day off up. It'll mess your evenings up because you've got to help somebody else and you wanted to watch your favorite TV show. It'll mess you up. It'll cost you something. You'll get involved in people's lives and they are flat broke and it's going to cost you something to help them out of the mess they find themselves in. It will mess you up. It's risky. It's bloody. And that's exactly what this man was going through at that time. It'll mess your schedules up. It'll mess your resources up. The question is, do we really care enough to get involved? Do we love our neighbor? The Samaritan in the story is the cultural bad guy. He was the cultural bad guy in the first century Israel. He's despised for his religion. The Samaritans had a strange religion. They were, they were kind of a strange mix of Judaism and Assyrian paganism. The Assyrians come in about 722 B.C. and they conquer the northern tribes. Remember after the reign of Solomon, King Solomon, uh, Jeroboam takes the ten tribes to the north and uh, uh, Rehoboam take, takes the uh, tribes to the south, the two tribes in the south. So Jeroboam's in the north, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is in the south. He's with Judah and Benjamin. And so to keep the people from going back down into Jerusalem, Jeroboam sets up calf idols in the towns of Bethel and Dan. And so he was afraid if they're going back to Jerusalem every year for their pilgrimages, they're going to go back and return and be one solid nation again. So to keep them divided forever, they set up their own places of worship up in the north. They were the first kingdom to go into idolatry, and so they are also the first nation to go into captivity. Now about 200 years later, we also know that Judah will go into captivity, but they will, after 70 years in Babylon, will be allowed to return back to Jerusalem. And so they come back, their faith remains more pure, their belief in the one true Jehovah God remains more pure. But when nations would come in and take over other nations, they would take the best and brightest away back to Assyria, but they also left many Syrians right there in the northern kingdoms. And so you've got Assyrians marrying people of Jewish descent. And so they're worshiping idols at Dan and Bethel. They're worshiping the gods of Assyria, and they're worshiping also Jehovah God. There's a remnant who are believing in Jehovah God. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. By the way, that story's coming up in a couple of weeks. Remember the story with the, the Jesus at the woman in the well. Jesus says to her, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. You are confused in your worship. You don't understand who you're worshiping. It's some kind of amalgamation of heathenism and Judaism, and it's all combined together, and you don't even know who you're worshiping. And so because of the Samaritan betrayal, they are hated by the Jews. The Jews in Jerusalem said, we're the pure Jews. We've kept it pure. We, we, we haven't defiled ourselves. We haven't intermarried like you have. And so there's this, all this prejudice between Jews and Samaritan. And yet he is the one who cleans the man's wounds, saddles him in his donkey, and pays for his total recovery. And the crowd's listening. And, he, and he's talking, and he's talking to the scribe and all those who are gathered around there, and they are literally stunned by the conclusion of the story because in their minds, this Samaritan is acting more like a believer or a Jew than the Jews were. 
The, the man at the end of the story said, when Jesus said, who then is thy neighbor? He couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He just simply said, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus says, you see what the Samaritan did, all of you go and do likewise. Do the same thing. The Samaritan is set up as the example for all the Jews to follow and how that must have ground at them and chafed at them because they hate the Samaritans. The point of the story is not just to help a person in need. Now follow me here. If that was the point of the story that we're called by God to help people in need, and yes, there is that point there, the point of the story is he intentionally says a Samaritan was the one to help. The point of the story is we can't cut out any people group, any ethnic group, any social group, any kind of group that's different than us. We can't cut them out from our circle of friends or those we are going to love. The point is you love their, your neighbor even though they are different than you and even though they are difficult to live with. Often we've created this mentality about other religions or other people groups or other backgrounds or other lifestyle choices that it's kind of an us versus them mentality and that we're the Christians and we're holding down the fort and we're keeping the theology pure and everybody else is outside the circle and we can't love them and we can't get close and we treat them like the enemy. When the book of Ephesians says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, they're not the enemy, but against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness and darkness in high places. They are not our enemy. We love them and reach out to them and we care for them because they need Jesus Christ. If Jesus told the story today, he might retell it in this way. Man is heading on the road from Somerville to Charleston. He's carjacked. He's beaten with crowbars. They leave him on the side of the road in the ditch. He's bleeding profusely. He's about to bleed out. He's about to die. They take his wallet. They take his ID. They steal his car, and they leave him to die. Pastor drives by. He's in a hurry. He's got a speaking engagement. He's got a lot of people waiting on him. He's an important dude. He's got to get there to speak. A group leader passes by next. He's in a hurry to get to a small group. Got a group of people coming to his house. Got to get the house cleaned up. Got to get it ready. Got to, got to be ready for my small group, and we're going to talk about love. Right. <laughs> but he's got to get there. He's got to get the refreshments out and the chips and dips ready and the uh, Pepsis. And then a Muslim drives by. The Muslim stops his car. And the Muslim goes over and he begins to help the guy up and begins to take a rag and put a tourniquet on his arm and on his leg and he begins to help the guy and he picks him up and he put, puts him in his brand new car and he gets blood all over the upholstery because he's still bleeding. Runs down the road to Trident Hospital. Goes in the hospital and of course Trident says, we can't take you unless you've got your uh, medical ID and your insurance card. Or you're going to pay us a lot of money up front. And uh, the Muslim man says, listen, just put it on my tab. Here's my information. Put it on my tab. Run up the bill. Whatever it costs. Whatever it costs. I'll take care of it. I'll pay the bill. And you know that emergency rooms are not cheap. And so then Jesus says, who is the neighbor? And we might, they might say in our vernacular today, the Muslim. Now, when you hear that story, after seeing the video we saw when we opened the service up, there's a little something inside of us that wants to recoil. We want to lump every Islamic man together, Islamic lady together, and put them all into the category of radical terrorists. And we cut off a whole group of people who need Jesus Christ who need the Lord, and we keep our distance. 
and we see them in their burkas and their coverings and we see them in the mall and we don't understand why they dress like that and instead of talking to them and engaging them and finding out a little bit who they are and reaching out to them we kind of cross to the other store on the other side of the mall to avoid getting too close it's just something inside of us that kind of grinds because we have visions of what happened 15 years ago now you begin to get the impact of the story. The sociological climate in our culture right now is one of aggression and prejudice towards Muslim people. And the scribe says, who is thy neighbor? And we ask ourselves, who is my neighbor? And we try to justify our prejudice and we try to say, you know what, it's okay and you don't understand what they've done. And we hope to narrow by that very question itself, we hope to narrow the definition of neighbor. And we all do it and we try to, box neighbor into people who are like me and look like me and talk like me, and that becomes our neighbor. And the scribe says, scribe could tell you all day long how deeply he loved God and how much he cared about God and yet still did not understand how to love other people. Our neighbors aren't determined by race, creed, gender, religion. They are all made in the image of God. They have God's fingerprints all over them. And if we belong to God, we need to love like him, and it means loving unconditionally. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Look, if you would, at verse number 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, love one another, for love comes from God. We don't pick and choose who our neighbors are, which means we don't pick and choose who we love and we don't love. God, the Bible says, is spirit. And so to worship him in John 4, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. But God is hiding behind his created humanity. Now let me explain what I mean by that. To get to God, I've got to love his people. Every person you hate becomes a barrier between you and God. He hides behind his humanity. He says, how can you say you love God who you have not seen when you don't love your neighbor who you see every day? He says, if you want to get to me, you've got to love your neighbor. He hides behind the humanity of his creation. He would say in Matthew, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. You can't bypass it. People of other faiths, other backgrounds, pain and race are not the enemy. They are searching for their purpose. They are searching for eternity. They are asking the same question the scribe asked, what must I do to have eternal life? And yet they are in darkness and they need God's light. And if we don't love them, if we don't reach out to them, if we don't touch them, they will never know, they will never hear, and they will die without Christ. We must be passionate about rescuing them. The world is hurting. The world sees us go in and out of our driveway every Sunday morning, coming to Faith Assembly of God. They may e even hear us talk about the Lord from time to time, but do they see our love? If we love first, they will listen to our message. You see, we're evangelical. We want to tell the good news. We want to we wanna share the word and we want to share our testimony. That's great and that's good and powerful. But if you don't love them first, there's not an open ear of receptivity to hear what you have to say. So we do all the babbling about how they can be saved and changed, but we don't care about them. Do we really love? We love first. Loving first opens up their heart to the message. It says in verse number 33, I want you to look at it very carefully. It says, the Samaritan came 
to where the man was. He was intentional in showing practical love. Somewhere, somehow, you've got to get involved yourself. It can't be Christian speak. It can't be something we talk about on Sunday morning. We've got to be intentional about building relationships with those who the Bible calls are our neighbors. Intentionality. The Samaritan went to where he was. And so if we're going to reach this world, we have got to go to where they are at. And we've got to love where they are at. And we've got to minister where they are at. There are some things you cannot do from a distance, and ministry is one of them. You can't minister from afar. You can't change anybody's life from a distance. At some point, you've got to go to where they're at. I like the story of, of, of in the Gospels where Jesus is near Capernaum. And the Bible says there was a man that was there that was a leper. And the leper cries out, and he says, Master, you can heal me if you will. Now, all Jesus had to do was speak the word and say, be healed. And you know that leper would have been healed because Jesus had all authority, all power, and he could have easily said, just be healed. But the Bible's very careful to say Jesus Christ went to the man and he reached over and he touched him. He touched him. Now, two things are going on there. If you touch a leper, you yourself become unclean. In fact, the lepers, wherever they walked in and out of villages near people, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean. But there was also the belief that you could, they were also highly contagious. And so you certainly didn't want to touch a leper, leper lest you catch their leprosy. It didn't matter to Jesus Christ. He goes over there, he touches him, he heals the man. And I want to propose to you, if we're going to see our neighbors change and come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to go to where they're at, we've got to be intentional, we've got to touch them, we've got to get a little bloody, we've got to take a risk, we've got to get a little dirty, we've got to mess up our schedules and our agendas, we've got to pay a little bit. We've got to touch them in some way tangibly. It's hard to minister to anyone you loathe to touch. That includes someone from a different race, culture, or even a well-known sinner. Jesus touched such people when he ministered to them. How can you win someone to Christ if you never touch them? We've got a table set up behind me. Room at the table. That's the name of our series. We're, we're, we're talking about everybody's welcome. Everybody can come in. doesn't matter where, what's your background, what's going on. Everybody's welcome. And as I think about the table, I'm kind of reminded of my dining experience. Say, for example, I want to take Jeannie out to a nice restaurant. And I want to celebrate our anniversary, birthday, or just take her on a date night. And we go out to eat at a nice restaurant. Now, if it's me, if it's just me, I can eat my meal in five minutes and 36 seconds. <laughs> Do, doesn't matter what it is. Five minutes, 36, steak, dessert, whatever. Five minutes, 36 seconds. It takes Jeannie about 30 minutes. But, but it's, if, if I ate my meal and just said, I'm done, I'm out of here, the meal, the dinner is about the experience, not the food. Now what we try to do is we try to pawn off fast food religion. So we want you to come in, hear our story, change your life, do this and that, and no one ever enters in to the experience. And so I've got to sit there, and what we do is we engage in conversation. I've got to listen. I've got to hear what she's saying. I've got to understand, I've got to look her in the eyes, I've got to hear about her day and about her life and about what's going on, I've got to listen and I've got to hear and we have got to share. And it takes time and energy and being intentional, it is all about the experience. I can't rush out or I will miss the opportunity. And then can you imagine at the end of the meal, especially if she's a date, once in a while I'll say it now because we're married, but... Uh, can you imagine saying you're trying to, by the way, baby, will you pick up the tab? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my wallet. <laughs> How'd that happen? Oh, my. You know, reaching around for the wallet. You got the short arms, the gator arms, and you can't, you, you, you uh, 
Can you imagine taking your date out and at the end of the date saying, by the way, can you pick this one up? No, I got to pay for the tab. I got to pay the bill. Pay for the check. To have room at the table takes work. If we're going to talk about having room at Faith Assembly of God for everybody, regardless of their background, where they come from, what's going on in their life, if everybody is welcome here, it takes work. We've got to be intentional about bringing them in. We've got to be intentional about loving them. We've got to be intentional about serving them. We've got to do acts of kindness intentionally throughout the week. We've got to be the light wherever we go. We've got to cross bridges and barriers of people who are different than us if we're going to see them Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to be intentional. This Samaritan took his time. The Bible says he pours on the oil. The oil was the soothing substance to his wound. It's what made the wounds feel better because he also poured on the wine. The wine is the antiseptic. The wine burnt. The wine hit the wound. I probably poured the wine on first and then put the oil on. But he pours on the oil and the wine. He bound up his wounds. He places them on his donkey. And then he picks up the tab and pays for everything. What if we invest in people just like he did? What if we became intentional with our time and our energy and our affections and our money? Think what can be done through the faith assembly of God, the kingdom of God, right here in Somerville and Goose Creek and all around. This is the kind of experience that will change you and God can use you. And here's the incredible thing. When I leave the table at the end of the conversation, at the end of the sharing, at the end of this prolonged meal, and we have talked and had fellowship, I leave full. And what happens, you will find as you reach out and you begin to minister to other people and you love on them and you care about them and you mess up your schedule and you do whatever it takes to help somebody in their crisis, you yourself get filled back up, refreshed because you've served and had the privilege of serving. There's room at the table for everyone. There's room at the table for the Muslim. There's room at the table for the atheist. There's room at the table for the drug addict. There's room at the table for the prostitute. There's room at the table for anybody. And we've got to be the ones who will bring them to the table. But I will tell you, it will be messy. It will be bloody. It will be inconvenient. It will be risky. And it will cost you. But we must connect them to Christ so somehow they can experience his life. So what do we do? We love God, we love others, and we love unconditionally. We've got an incredible story. I can't wait for you to see it. Testimony of one of our ladies, Alicia Owens, from our Remount campus. Take a look. I was drinking every night of the week, drunk, and... I didn't know where I was at. I was miserable. I was, I was lost. High school is um, where my parents divorced and I started learning um, what attraction to other people was about and trying to fill the void of my dad leaving uh, with other people. I thought that giving myself to other people would, would satisfy me. And the downward spiral continued to where finally I was, I was found attraction to women and led a homosexual lifestyle for 12 years and lived through abusive relationship, physically, uh, mental, um, losing my home, losing different things throughout losing friendships. Um, I knew there had to be more than this miserable lifestyle that I was choosing every single day. I started going to a Bible study with my family um, who was going to faith and um, I started being more interested in it and realizing but there was definitely more to this. There was, there was definitely a light to the end of the tunnel by going through these Bible studies. I still was struggling with the homosexual lifestyle. Um, 
I continued on with another relationship for another three years. And finally, God was like, Alicia, choose me. Choose me. And so I did. I chose him. And he delivered me from smoking. Um, he delivered me from homosexuality. He del delivered me from alcoholism. He, he is brought me through everything. He was there the entire time. It was my choice to not choose his hand and walk with him. Now uh, I've um, started attending Faith Remount and three years ago, three and a half years ago, I started with the outreach ministries and just serving and then offering, I was offered by the by the church to be a preschool leader um, or for a nursery leader. And now I am actually the preschool director. And now I am also working at the Mom's Morning Out program as the preschool teacher. I am I'm grateful that the Lord never left me behind. He never let go of me. And I constantly am grateful and thankful for His love his unconditional love. For those of you who are lost, who are confused, who don't know where to turn, he's the only way. If I can be delivered from everything that I was delivered from, you can too. That is such an incredible story. There are stories like this all over this place. It's God's grace. It's God's grace. We love and we love and we keep loving. And they come to find Jesus Christ and their lives are changed, delivered, cleansed, sins taken away, new life in Christ Jesus, all through his blood. <laughs> 